Lincoln in Queens. Lincoln in Queens is a tale. This tale has seven segments called Iron, Unemployed, A Vision, Depression, Journey, The Furies, and Offering. Iron. Both my grandfathers worked in the mill. Steel workers. My father was an unemployed steel worker when I was born. The clangor and night fires of the vast old mills along the rivers swore to me in fearful curses that the earth is iron and poor. Steel mills burned the earth in my eyes. Long trains loaded with coal or slag made my home on a hill over the mill. Orange smoke from blast furnaces billowed above Steel Valley. Polluted rivers ran yellow and sluggish. Men ate their earnings from a lunchbox. I am of the race of iron, still living in the Iron Age. Do I have to work at a blast furnace? Do I have to make steel in blasts of heat in a big barn-like foundry between railroad tracks and the river? The oldest poems that survive condemn the race of iron to work and waste. Our hearts are owned forever by war and the war debts of our fathers chanted the savages. The people of iron destroy. We tear and burn the earth. So we dreamed our fate into development. Or so the first poems say. The author of The Birth of Gods says that in his second song, The Work Day. I don't believe it. I think it's primitive. In World War II, my father blew up ships on the huge moon reflected on the Pacific Ocean. He was a bombardier in a black-painted night raider, a navy plane with pontoons. They hid by day in bays of New Guinea. After the war, he worked in the mill, but the work was dirty and hot with many layoffs. My father left the mill. He got a job with the fire department. He drove a red fire truck into danger. He drove the pump truck at number four station. I inherit firefighting too as my job in Iron City. It's a strenuous confusion. The Iron Age rages with furnace fires. Unemployed. My job is the most evil ever, according to Plato. I write poems about politics not from logic, but from inspiration. I excite myself and spurt disruptive fantasies all over the social fabric, in danger to the state and order. But here's the irony, iron E, iron I, the I run of insight. I dream of hidden logic. I speak of ancient things because I search them for inspiration. They are the wild wine I share with you. I violate another of Plato's rules for Western civilization. I should not know so goddamn much about the rules. I am of the race of iron. In a republic, we must be taught with myths to do the work. We must believe we were born in the earth to work with dirt. We should only hear about daylight from people of gold. I have no gold in my nature, just red dirt. With a resume like that, I was, of course, out of work, like my father at my birth. I was, at the time of this story, living near a river and the ruins of factories in Queens. I was an unemployed lecturer in law. I lived on unemployment benefits. Each Thursday, I reported to the state on my efforts to find a new job. One day in August, I walked to the state office building through the bleak, hot, shadeless sameness of industrial queens. I had to watch out for thundering big trucks full of demolished debris. I thought about money, jobs, women, 
big trucks, dramatic poetry, the landscape, the great city, my unhappy childhood, love, abandonment, the arms race, and the worldwide crisis of production. What I resolved was this. I would keep writing tragic plays, but I would not get hit by a truck. Get to the unemployment office safely, get a job, find a woman, and fall in love, even unwisely, but as soon as possible. A vision. I was on my way to sign for my last unemployment check. I walked past auto body shops, past car wrecks dumped on sidewalks outside open garages. I walked by the ornate old courthouse and onto a traffic island named for a corporal killed in a war. On that island of concrete in the streets beyond the courthouse stood a man dressed all in black old clothes in the sun. He was tall, lean, and stooped. He stared at me. I thought he was homeless and needed money. He pointed at me and spoke. You have obeyed the gods too long for our love. Now you must be punished with our last commandment. Make peace. I stopped, astounded. For this man had recited very well verses from my play, Electra. He had played Apollo in a vision. I turned about. No one else was around, no one staring at this chanting man. Still pointing, he went on. You must set off at once into impassable solitude to find the Furies. I am the master of Furies, I snapped at this insolent stranger. He snapped back. The Furies will haunt you. Who are you, I cried, suddenly scared of the Furies. He just looked back at me. He looked like Lincoln, but couldn't be not back from the dead in Queens. Yes, he was Abe Lincoln, the emancipator. He spoke softly with quiet authority. I abolish slavery through war. You must begin to abolish war. War is no more natural than slavery. The chain of war was dug from the earth by slaves, and it is made of iron. It's time to shut down the Iron Age and demolish a lot of useless things like war. I was astonished by this vision and his vision of peace. How? I asked. You must find the Furies. Alecto, Magura, Tasiphone. The female Furies ruled before the gods. They are forgotten and angry. They still feed our brain stems. The law of the Furies is guilt. The justice of Furies is terror. If we can free and appease the Furies, the super spell on our minds will break. The war state will crumble. There will be good new jobs in a free spirit of work. And you must find the Furies. But the Furies are un-American, I cried. They're archaic female powers. They're ancient Greek. They're no way to communicate today. No one will understand me when I talk about Furies. They're like witches. They're not the faith of Lincoln. Lincoln spoke of God like a lost lover. I lived in faith in the old-fashioned fable of suffering and moral endurance. We purged the blood curse on our nation, slavery. Now you can escape the iron shackles of war, the fable of blood atonement, the faith of furies. Your hope is in creation. I've given you a job. Prophesy, abolish war. Lincoln turned away, 
and entered a grimy garage where men looked back at me with anger at my staring. I called. President Lincoln, wait. Please, tell me a joke. Lincoln came out of the dark garage where a radio blared. He laughed. I was glad to see him smile, finally. You know how long a person's legs must be, he said. Long enough to reach the ground. But how long must a person's arms reach? Far enough to touch the stars, I said at once. Far enough to touch the people you love. Lincoln turned and walked into the garage, and men pulled down the clamoring, blank, metal door that gleamed silver in the harsh sun. Depression. I told my girlfriend, Lincoln himself ordered me to set off at once into impassable solitude. Right away, she left me. My job was impossible. Finding furies could not end war. Furies were metaphors, myths. They were obsolete myths, no contemporary resonance. I was trapped in poetic language, struggling to speak in politics. I was sure to self-destruct on this mission. But I searched for the Furies in old books, in troubled sleep, and on my walls and ceiling. My productivity declined. I stole my own thoughts from others. I went out to hear poets in readings in cafes and bars in slums. I was out of place in public and retreated. I laid heartsick in the fetal position. I was totally laid off. My depression deepened in a worldwide structure of depression. The spirit of ego had seized the meaning of work, and the spirit of work had nothing to do. I was broke, broken, guilty, obeying the dead in a futile endeavor to raise the dawn. I applied for a job as a judge. I put on a suit and rode the subway as if I had a job. I was happy there. I realized I was already in love unwisely. There was no rush to find love. She wrote me a letter just to say goodbye again. I could read it over and over. Love would be even better after the irony. Journey. Out of a desk drawer, I finally pulled my credit card, my master card. I'd saved it from better days as my last resource till I found work. I stared at the plastic key to $1,000 credit. I leapt in search of the Furies. I bought a plane ticket to New Mexico and flew off at once. I rented a car with my charge card and drove into the mountains, the blood of Christ, up a winding road beside chasms from scrub pine and silvery sage shrubs through pine forest to the hidden summit of Los Alamos. I searched where men created the atom bomb to find the furies and unlock creation. Los Alamos was bland on a bright steam shovel leveled mountain top. 
planted with grass and suburban structures around huge guarded hangars and buildings for nuclear weapons research. I drove round and round in a rented car, watched by guards at the many gates, with nowhere to stop but a small museum and a duck pond where the ice house had been, where they built the bomb. I found no inspiration in the vast enterprise. The place made me numb. I had to leave. I'd thrown away a thousand dollars I didn't have. Driving down the mountain at its base, in scrub pine and silvery sage shrubs, I followed signs to cliff dwellings of vanished Indians. The cliffs were white stone. Alone, I climbed ladders up a cliff and sat in a hollow looking south to the white sands desert of Alamogordo. Where are the furies, hags, witches, old crones of the moon, withered ancients, or young girls from the dawn of humanity, or my furious mother, dead ten years. The furies chased the damned. Wasn't my mission to end war, my trip to this cave, a mad, haunted flight of the damned? My furious mother sat in the cave beside me. We looked at each other, unable to reach each other, and we cried, caught together in heavy chains of suicide. The Furies. My mother had worked in a five and ten after high school. Then she got married to a young veteran who worked in the mill. I learned words at her feet, learned to read while she did the ironing in hissing steam clouds. She liked to get out, to go bowling or in her black dress to a banquet of the American Legion or the Song Club. Her neck swelled, scaring us all. Her thyroid pumped adrenaline too fast. She saw too fiercely too much that made her miserable, fearful, frantic to escape. My parents had terrible fights for years. In a confused and shameful divorce, she gave up custody of her children. She found work with a dentist, but she had cancer and brutal surgery. She stayed alive for years on welfare, chattering nonstop when I visited home from college or law school. Her apartment was closed and stifling. Her refrigerator held laundry and beer. The closets held piles of pill bottles. She left a note when she died. Maybe she killed herself to end her solitary suffering. Now she sat beside me in a hollow in a white cliff below Los Alamos. I said, I'm sorry I've disturbed you in death. I often dream of you, confused in my somber dream, baffled by death. You shiver and sit down. You stay as if you are home in a new house Full of fear, you show his nervousness. You keep making jokes nervously. Taking your hand, I talk you elaborately away. You take my hand with fake good humor to wander slowly out of the place as I let go. I'm still afraid to keep you. Our loss of family life was brutal, but blameless, I hope. 
I'm still mourning in my ongoing difficulties in love. She said, you know you left me alone when I was sick, when I wanted to live with you. I said, I had to make my own way. You wanted me to stay in school. She said, but then you threw away your chances to make good. Now you sit in a cave as a failure. Now making your way is not so very important. I can live with you now, please. I held out my hand to her. She took my hand and got up. We looked at each other as if for the last time, like the last time we saw each other. I said, yes, we do live together. We embraced, and I stood alone in a cave, looking south to the white sands of Alamogordo. Offering. I returned to New York and took work as an office temp, humiliated by clerical work in a Wall Street law firm. I reflected on my search for the Furies, spinning circles, the driven and mad, pursuing ourselves. Finding my mother as my Furies seemed so much a cop-out on politics, more failure. Then I knew that voice inside, haunting my every move, was the Furies. I'm at home with Furies. The Furies press home doubts, sneering like children, repeating the scorn they heard in their parents. The Furies accuse, and I answer by shaping peace in fragments I must make to be complete. Will you make offerings to lost spirits? The Furies ask with big, skeptical eyes. So I offer this work to lost spirits. May we make peace as we find them. Thank you.